We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. So good morning, I'm Bertrand Moulier. I'm representing the International Federation of uh, Film Producers Associations, which is uh, the anagram is FIAPF, it's the French anagram. Uh, FIAP membership is made up of audiovisual producers associations from 29 countries currently uh, from throughout the world. Our constituency is made up of uh, producers of the entire range of audiovisual productions. So that's films, TV programs, other audiovisual programs for online only, etc. We currently have national member organizations in Poland, Argentina, Canada, China, Germany, India, Japan, Nigeria, Russia, Turkey, the UK, the USA, etc. We also have uh, informal working relationships with uh, quite a few more producers organizations around the world, most of which, and that's important to us, are in countries with emergent uh, audiovisual production capability and industries. And I'll come back to that later. So we meet regularly to discuss global issues. We speak with one voice uh, on all developments in technologies, laws and regulations that directly or indirectly affect our ability, the ability of our industries to remain economically sustainable. So being sustainable, uh, let me say what we mean by that, is not just about balancing the books. Being sustainable is having sufficient resources available to enable us uh, and our creative businesses enterprises uh, to play our part fully in fostering dynamic cultural exchanges everywhere and reflecting how people live and what occupies their hearts and minds. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I will talk a little bit about what audiovisual producers do uh, in their lives, in their working lives. I will then discuss how the growth of the internet and that of the audiovisual content production sector are closely linked and why it matters for the UN and its member states to incentivize our sector synchronously with the internet infrastructure and services. Pardon me. I will end with a shopping list of principles that we hope will help lead to more joined up approaches to policies and incentives based on a better understanding of what a sustainable local audiovisual content production ecosystem can do for the growth of internet and vice versa. On Tuesday this week, uh, in an IGF lightning talk, uh, it was 5 p.m., uh, 6 p.m. rather, uh, this week on Tuesday, I was in conversation with Sarah Migwi. Sarah is the CEO of Protel Studios. Protel is based in Nairobi, Kenya. From there, Sarah and her team produce audiovisual content designed to reflect the local cultural conversation, the social political issues that affect ordinary people in Kenya, what their dreams and aspirations may be, what angers them, what scares them, what makes them laugh, what gives them hope, how they fall in love or out of love, how they handle family relations and life's many transitions. Like all film and TV and digital program producers everywhere in the world, Sarah is first and foremost a storyteller. Before she and her team can shoot a single frame of a TV drama series or a sitcom, they will have spent months, sometimes years, considering ideas that best reflect, amplify, and dramatized life as it is lived in a richly complex and multi multicultural setting that is contemporary Kenya. And she and her team will have hired writers who can give dramatic shape and direction to the storylines and the characters. And they'll have cast the actors, appointed the directors, and hopefully convinced local TV channels or online platforms to buy the finished product uh, of this long and complex and costly and risky creative gestation. So this is what happened uh, with Protel's very successful uh, comedy uh, uh, half hour, I think it's a, it's, it's a half hour format, yes. The Real House Helps of Kawanguare, which they developed in the company uh, at their own cost and risk. The show, which went, which went on air for the first time in 2014, was an immediate hit with Kenyan uh, viewers. But it is still running today, a test to its lasting appeal. The colorful and often comical House Helps of the title endeared themselves with Kenyan viewers because they echoed their own lives, the social mores, the hypocrisies, and also the fun, the joy and generosity 
manifest in so many so-called ordinary lives. In the show, characters speak mostly Sheng. It's an urban Kenyan patois made up of various linguistic influences and that people use as a sort of lingua franca in the streets of Nairobi and other big cities. We see here the importance of audiovisual works in maintaining the buoyancy of, of, of local languages. Much further to the northwest of where Sarah uh, Migui and her dynamic creative team live and work, we find Mohamed Hebsi. Mohamed is Egyptian and runs a very prolific Cairo-based business, making feature films and series for television or VOD streamers. His company is called Film Clinic. Film Clinic is also a distribution company that commercializes the films Mohamed and his team make. <clears throat> Excuse me. They distribute them in the Arab world, its vast diaspora as well, and in the world at large. Mo's uh, business model may be quite different from Sarah's. He makes mostly feature films designed for the cinema as the initial release and market, um, where she makes uh, television drama, sitcoms, lifestyle programs, sports programs, all of which are for television and OTT platform. But that's about all the difference between them. Like Sarah, Mohammed too is a storyteller, first and foremost. Like Sarah, Mohammed will spend a long time, years sometimes, developing an idea for a film, taking it through a complex and costly story outline and script writing process, all without guarantee that he will eventually be able to raise the funds necessary for the project to become a reality uh, and, a, and the finished product you can enjoy. For four years, between 20, four years, 2013 and 2016, Mohammed Hevzi and his company got behind a vision of a young, committed writer-director called Mohamed Diab. The resulting film financed for an international co-production, painstakingly put together by Mohamed Hevzi and his team, and involving Egypt, Germany, and France, was the multiple award-winning film Clash. The title said it, says it all. It all takes place inside a police van during a demonstration in Cairo, in which a confrontation between two opposite sides descends into violence. Locked up inside the van, a small number of demonstrators from both sides slowly learn to come to terms with their differences. The film had a character of political and moral urgency. At its heart was a striking plea for fractious groups in a divided country to find a pathway to necessary dialogue and the renewal of social cohesion, or at least some of it. It's, uh, the texture of the film Trash was local, but like so many other good works from humble TV sitcoms, to feature films made by committed authors, its content had and still has universal relevance. Now, I could go on like this because the two examples I've just given can all too easily be multiplied by looking at what audiovisual producers do and the essential social and cultural role they perform all over the world, not just in Kenya or Egypt or uh, the Middle East. But what may you ask, uh, could any of this possibly have to do with IGF's preoccupation uh, with the development, governance, and regulation of the global internet. Well, let me give you an idea. We are, uh, that's we, the audiovisual sector, as I've just established, the storytellers. Now, we don't have a monopoly on stories. Of course we don't. Nobody does. Cultures perish when only the few control and dictate the stories that define and animate them. But through the mastery of the complex professional skills required to make audiovisual works to the high standard expected by consumers, people such as Sarah Migwi and Mohamed Hefzi are especially well placed to imagine, conceive, and give audiovisual form to stories to be enjoyed both by the many and the few. As storytellers, we use any new technology and the business models it spawns to the same end, communicating to as many people as possible the stories we've put in audiovisual form. In what follows, I will briefly, very briefly, outline core principles and policy priorities that we at FIAT and in the wider global community of audiovisual producers wish to see established and implemented. We believe these principles and priorities are fully aligned with the UN Millennial Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. We believe these principles and the policies they should inspire would help ensure our industry is able to make the best possible use of internet and its enhanced power of dissemination. And in doing so, it will properly empower, it will be properly empowered itself to fulfill its role as a facilitator for cultural exchange and social cohesion 
in this extraordinarily successful technology for the sharing of knowledge and culture. So the first principle is that internet growth and this sustainable audiovisual production are conjoined factors, as I said at the beginning. We need, therefore, to have joined up policies to reflect this fact. It is indeed an established fact everywhere in the world that people's appetite for audiovisual works, be they factual or fiction, be they entertainment or education or both, sometimes entertainment can be edu educational, drives the demand for internet connection. Mohammed, Sarah, and the other storytellers who take the huge creative and business risks I described above need to be active participants in the development of the internet globally and in the expansion of its social and cultural impact. We want in, not out. And we want all stakeholders in the global internet to include us in the formulation of meaningful governance principles and policies. The fact that audiovisual content made by the professional industry is a strategic driver for internet growth is still only very poorly reflected in local and international policies and regulations. There is in fact considerable lack of joined up policies to ally stimulus measures for internet connectivity and uptake and the incentivizing of sustainable domestic audiovisual content production. It is really as if the two existed in separate silos policy-wise. So we urge governments and the, multi the multilateral system to consider the need for integrating and combining incentives for internet growth with incentives for the development of sustainable local audiovisual content production. Again, what we mean by, <coughs> excuse me, again, what we mean by sustainable in this instance is an ecosystem in which producers of audiovisual content are able to make a career out of making and disseminating works that are culturally, linguistically, and socially relevant to the cultures in which they participate, and may also help break down barriers between cultures as content travels uh, across borders. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second thing is, of course, the need for universal broadband. Now, ubiquitous connectivity and quality connectivity are shared goals for all stakeholders at IGF. Of course, the audiovisual production sector unreservedly supports the IGF goal of connectivity for all people everywhere. Improved and expanded connectivity translates into growing opportunities for producers and their creative and distribution partners to reach new users and to satisfy the runaway demand for quality culture, entertainment, and education. The third important policy principle is the safety and security online. This, as we've seen, has been a salient issue on the discussion of this IGF, as well as past editions of the annual IGF. Consumers, businesses, and governments must trust that their safety and security are protected online for the internet economy to continue to grow and for its social dividends to pay off. IP protection, intellectual uh, property protection, is an essential part of users' safety and security. It is a fallacy to suggest that copyright and other IP rights are for the privileged privilege few. These laws and regulations protect all creations of the spirit everywhere, including audiovisual works. They protect small companies as well as large companies. They, and they enable small audiovisual entrepreneurs such as Sarah Migwi and Mohammed Hefsi, not, but also the thousands of our producers are working with vision and passion every day around the world to convert their and their team's talent and hard work into creative assets that can sustain them and the jobs that they have created locally. But IP laws are only as effective as those who use them. We therefore call on governments and the UN to place more emphasis, far more emphasis, on training and education for people in the creative industries, and in particular, the audiovisual sector as being especially IP intensive and complex. A piece of audiovisual content is nearly always a complex aggregation of various IP rights, and it is vital that producers who bear the brunt of the legal and economic responsibility for making the content should be aware of the importance of chain of title and copyright and other IP rights documentation. In this way, they will be able to ensure the creative assets to generate are duly protected and valued for the benefit of all creative participants in audiovisual work. So a call here for far more training efforts to be deployed. The next principle is freedom of expression. <clears throat> now free expression is critical, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, to the creative industries as vehicles 
for the cultural conversation and its broader implications in the field of social life and political debate. However, we also recognize the precept that of necessity, the right to free expression is not absolute. There are long-standing limitations on expression where it impinges on the rights of others and their integrity, e.g. hate speech or incitation to racial violence, for instance. And these limitations need to be exercised consistent, consistently with international standards everywhere. Similarly, we oppose any internet service justifying inaction in the face of intellectual property rights violation by instrumentalizing or hiding behind the spurious freedom of expression defense. The next principle is that the internet is not the only future for audiovisual distribution. We need to maintain the diversity of media and mode of consumption. Although the importance of audiovisual content as a driver for internet development is a well-documented fact, this should not mean that governments and the multilateral system should consider that the future of the audiovisual economy is nece necessarily destined to be entirely online. Audiovisual content production is inherently risky, requiring considerable upfront investment and sunk costs, with very little possibility of forecasting revenue from the exploitation of the rights in the finished film or audiovisual content. In order to exist and to thrive as a cultural sector, we need a diversity of production formats and distribution opportunities. This diversity benefits consumers too, because they then have a greater choice of media and platforms with a range of options and pricing points compatible with the variations in spending power, depending on where in the world you are. This means, for instance, that public policies and incentives should also be focused on the long-term viability of audiovisual media other than online. Linear broadcast TV is proving extraordinarily resilient despite the false predictions of its imminent demise by online determinists. Cinemas also, and despite the damaging, damaging hiatus caused by the COVID emergency, remains a popular form of consumption of single audiovisual works and the important launch market for many films that also builds awareness amongst audiences for future online exploitation on legal offers. You only have to look at what's happening in Nigeria where actually the number of films, uh, the, of cinemas are growing and more and more so-called Nollywood films uh, premiere in, in Nigerian cinemas. Finally, we support the need for sound internet governance structures, and that's the ultimate object, objective behind incentivizing and governing the internet should be to promote a safe and secure global communications environment based on the rule of law, transparency, and accountability. The public interest should be foremost in the minds of all IGF stakeholders, with the protection of internet users and consumers especially prominent, as I've outlined further up. FIAP and its constituent members are committed to open, transparent, multi-stakeholder processes to meet this goal. IGF can, and already does, play an important part in such a process. We believe that to be successful, all members of the internet community must be meaningfully involved in fostering rights and responsibilities, community norms, and the protection of core values, such as respect for the consumer, connectivity for all, security, all principles I was outlining earlier on. IGF support, and I'll finish with this, uh, to the inclusion of the audiovisual sector and other creative industries is encouraging and it should be expanded in years to come in view of the well-documented connection, which I've outlined twice, between internet infrastructures and services growth and the demand for local and global audiovisual content. Now, finally, if you wish to know and understand more about the audiovisual production sector, you can visit our website. If you just Google uh, uh, www.fiap.org, uh, that's F for Freddy, I-A-P, F for Freddy.org, you will find resources there. We've just finished updating the website design and functionalities, and we'll be launching a new version within the next few weeks, where you'll be able to find many useful resources, including policy papers, but also short video interviews with working audiovisual content producers uh, from all over the world. So I thank you for your attention and wish you a successful conclusion to this the 2021 edition of IGF. I also thank on FIAP's behalf all the tireless staff at the IGF Secretariat for their support. 
And if there are any questions or points, please unmute and uh, talk to us. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, uh, well, a bit less than 10 minutes left now. <laughs> 